Welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby with the Dallas Prospect, joined again by my dude, Eni Nduka, to talk a little bit of Mavs basketball and a very nice victory last night, including the season debut of one Chris Stops Porzingis. Eni, how are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. Yesterday's game was very entertaining. I had a great time watching. It was great to see KP back. Uh, and amongst some other things that we're about to discuss. So we'll just go ahead and roll with it, buddy. Absolutely. So a, a few things to consider for this game going in. The Mavericks have five players out because of safety and health and safety protocols. Those being several key players, obviously Jalen Brunson, Dorian Finney-Smith, Josh Richardson, Dwight Powell, and Maxi Kleba all out of the lineup. So KP's injection back into the lineup was kind of necessary, although you kind of got the feeling that the Mavericks have been just waiting for the time to put him in. Like they've been the ones kind of holding him back a little bit on that front. And the timing here pretty much was no more time to wait. You just got to move on with it. So he gets back in and he has himself a very nice performance here as I'm pulling up his stats. The KPs? See. Yeah, KP went... It was like 21 minutes, 16 points. Uh, yeah, 16 points, in. four rebounds, two blocks for KP. I think he knocked down four threes as well. Yep. Um, so very nice there. And I talked about yesterday during uh, the birthday stream how while I didn't think he was going to be banging bodies necessarily, I thought that they... They were going to keep him more on the perimeter and see what he could do. Obviously, him shooting nine three-pointers is an indicator of that. But if you're knocking down four, hard to be too mad at you. Nope. 21 minutes, 16 <laughs> points, six of 16 from the field. That could use a little bit of a boost. But you saw a little bit of everything. You saw him attacking the basket, rolling well, finishing through some contact, and obviously the outside shot going down as well. Mm -hmm. very, you, also tried, very... you also saw him try to post up too a couple of times. Yep. I uh, do think once he gets his legs under him, he'll be able to get that mid-range game going. Yeah, which absolutely. will be vital. Ab absolutely. And uh, that's something in his game that he implemented very well in the bubble. So we'll see if he can do a little bit of that here as well as he kind of gets more comfortable and familiar with it. But I, I said he would play 25 minutes or fewer playing 21. I think that worked out. And he avoided foul trouble too. He only had three fouls in the game. So very good on that front. But obviously, the story beyond KP's return and as, as great and much needed as that is, and it shows you how good this team can be. Luka Doncic had himself. I mean, he's been on a crazy stretch lately the past five games. Um, he's absolutely tearing it up. Just misses out on the triple-double again last night, but he goes for 34-13, nine, four blocks, which I'm quite certain is a career high. And yeah, then two steals as well all by the end of the third quarter <laughs> like we might and i saw you post on twitter about this and i think it is a legitimate question we might have to start looking at him as a two-way player at this point because something seemed to click defensively for him in the bubble last year mm -hmm. and now with how he's starting to block shots and get steals and really it seems like he's attacking on defense more than just kind of playing uh not matador defense which yeah. again, is why that nickname was terrible. I don't know why they thought calling him the Matador <laughs> was ever a good idea. But yeah. uh, it, it's not just kind of sitting back and trying not to get beat. It seems like he's being the aggressor and he's winning a lot of these battles. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the things that um, I noticed with him, and, and yeah, we like to point out the fact that he got four blocks to stay two steals, is sometimes that's not an indication of, some, of someone being a good, def a good defender. It's just... Probably someone just gambles a lot and hunts for blocks and steals. But Westbrook, Luca's like, yeah, Luca's legit, legitimately playing good defense. He's sliding his feet well. He's, I mean, the few times that he's getting beat, he's recovering well. In fact, two of his two of his blocks that he got last night was off recovering. I think it was uh, against Gordon Hayward who beat yep. him off the dribble and he, you know, blocked him from the side. Great recovery. Um, it's so good to see because you know, as good as Luca was last year. And, you know, we, we probably, you know, we put him in the MVP, not really necessarily thinking that uh, his development would take this much of a, another increase, especially mm -hmm. how he came in, coming into the, to start the season. He's developing 
well beyond what I thought he was going to do in, in his third year. Like I thought there's no, there's not a lot of increase that, you know, we can see, but you know, not with just his defense to his offense. Like we're seeing a lot more variation on how he's attacking. He's adding the mid range game to his, uh, to his game and stuff like that. Dude, honestly, if he gets, if he gets everything rolling, there's literally nothing you could do uh, that could stop him. And pretty much, hunt, yeah, you, there's like you can't hunt for him on defense because he's turning into like a legitimate defender. Like I mean, he's not shutting you down, but he's not like Trey Young out there where he's like helpless oh, yeah. <laughs> when when it's isolation. So it's definitely a sight to see. It's definitely something to be really excited about, and it is something that we will need if we expect Dallas to be contending for championships. For sure. So uh, Luca's last five games I referenced earlier, 34 points, 13 and nine last night, 20, 11 and 10, 38, nine and 13, 33, 16 and 11, 27, 15 and seven. The dude, he's, he's started to turn the corner. He looks like Luca of last year, especially mm-hmm. bubble Luca and all of that. That was just filling up the stat sheet in a ridiculous way. And as you talked about, we were having conversations about how in the off season, like, Oh, the Mavericks need to go out and they need to get, you know, get these long rangy perimeter defenders that you can kind of put around Luca to kind of help him aid him and make it where you can, I mean, it was it kind of implied to hide him as you said mm-hmm. earlier. And what's come about now is suddenly he doesn't look like he needs hiding. Now, I'm not mm-hmm. saying he's better perimeter defender than, you know, Richardson or any of those other guys, but he has certainly elevated his game on that front. It's switchable. And yes. Yeah. yeah, he's absolutely elevated his game on that front. And he talked about how in the offseason, one of his main focuses was going to be uh, shooting. And it was a slow start this year. He is starting to pull those percentages back up. Uh, from two-point field goals, he's 57%. From three, he's just over 27%. Granted, he started in the basement there. Yeah, it was like his first one. It was like what? Six, it was like 6%. First yeah. Time. Yeah. Like it, was, it was, it was abysmal. And he started to turn that around. I think he had a few threes in this game as well. Looked a lot more comfortable and confident shooting on those as well. So I think we're like five for nine in this game, five for nine on this game. Okay. I, I believe so. Um, so yeah, he's, good. he's turned the corner, but it's more than just that. Even like the Mavericks defensively as a team have turned the corner here, five of their six wins. And uh, this comes from all things Mavs on Twitter he had the call out of the specific scores. I was aware of the trend. I wasn't, I didn't have the numbers in front of me. So I'm shouting him out on that. Uh, he points out, out five Crowther. of the, do what? I said, shout out Jimmy Crowther. Absolutely. So he points out that five of the six wins have come when the Mavericks have held their opponents to a hundred points or less, which is unfathomable last year or the year before or whatever that we hold five teams all season under that mark to do it in five yeah. of your first six wins is pretty incredible. Yeah. We had about, how many games? 75 or 72, 72 I believe, for this 72 season. 72 games last year. We held our opponents oh, under 100 yeah. points 15 times last year. Wow. Now we're only 10 games in. We've done it five times. Yep. Yeah. So, so our defense is trending very well. Uh, very well. Think, held I the forgot, Clippers to I, 73, the Heat to 83. Houston got straight up 100. Yeah. Um, Denver got 117, granted, in overtime, as he points out. Uh, Orlando, 98, and Charlotte, 93. That's your wins there. So a hundred or fewer in five of those six victories. And the one that wasn't uh, under a hundred had overtime involved with another top tier class uh, team in the Western conference. So really, really impressive how they're trending on that front. They're I think one of the best scoring defenses in the league, which incredible. I, know, I forgot, I forgot what Twitter uh, page said this, but I think the Mavericks are actually ranked number three in defense or at least rated number three in defense in all the NBA as of right now. I Which mean, is, yeah, we try. Yeah. We were like, Hey man, we'll go top 10 or at least outside the top 10. But now we're three. We can keep this up, dude. Like I've been saying Mark Followell here on Twitter says Mavericks have the second best defensive rating after tonight. Oh, wow. Okay. So they well, have so, moved up. It is. Well, it's impressive. If it, if it regresses back to the mean, what people say, I mean, there's, there's no, question that this can be a top 10 defense Mm -hmm. um and if we get back any semblance of what we had offensively last year not necessarily the record breaking the most efficient offense of all time but if we're yeah three four five or whatever top 10 in that 
I've been telling people all year, I, there, it would not shock me if the Mavericks can get the number two seed behind yeah. the Lakers this year. Like, that's completely reachable. Everything is always health permitting for sure. Well, that's if, very true. Yeah. If, if the Mavericks, however, do stay healthy, I think that they will be, they were number three in scoring offense last year. Now we know it was the most efficient in NBA history in terms of points per hundred possessions, mm -hmm. but they were number three in overall scoring output last year, but they were an 18th in defense to your point. I think they will be probably a top 10 defense. I don't think they're going to be top five necessarily, but they'll be hovering in that conversation. And that alone is an incredible improvement. If you look at the recent champions in history, they're always pretty much, I think there's one exception who I can't think of off the top of my head, but they're always top 10 in both offense and defense. Mm -hmm. So to be in that position, you're putting yourself in that conversation at the very least. So there's a lot to consider here on that. And it's, it's a, it's a team effort. It's Carlisle. We know he loves defense. We know that's a big thing of what made the 2011 team so special was how good they were defensively. And it was like, Hey, we can get the buckets when we need them. Like we can still score. We can score with just about anybody, mm -hmm. but we're really building our identity around being able to lock teams down and play gritty defense, which is why you were seeing them win games in the finals even before they, I know they turn it on late, obviously in that series, but like winning games early on in the finals without even cracking the century mark, like yeah. that's really impressive to do in the mm -hmm. finals against that team. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to say on that. And Luca, uh, this is a quote again, Paula well has on Twitter from Luca after the game. Uh, he says, the way you win championships is with defense. You got to be the best on the defensive end. You don't have defense. You're not going to achieve anything. That's why everybody is willing to play defense and sacrifice. I love the the maturity. Nice. Like we talk a lot about how frustrated he gets and how he can kind of wear his emotions on his sleeves for better and worse. Yeah. But when it comes to actually after the game and talking, he always seems to have his head screwed on right. You don't really see like immature emotional comments from him after the game. He seems like he's always very level headed. Even when they ask him like, you know, Hey, do you think you could win an MVP? He's like, I don't know. I think I could, but I don't really care about that. I want a championship. I want, the team accolades that's what matters not what i do yeah and i think that definitely has to resonate with teammates because if you have a guy like uh you know just got traded yesterday james harden i think there is that indication that man it's really about him more mm -hmm. than the team as a whole like he'll he'll be your your buddy and all that and you'll all work to a common goal but he's definitely very focused on his own accolades and his own reputation in that regard so i think with very luca so. it's refreshing Mm -hmm. very much so i mean we're all we're seeing it with you know all the i guess pretty much for the last couple of years we've seen every, every uh, star has to be traded in some in some way shape shape or form and i mean to be honest we can't say that luca's never going to ask for a trade but he is showing good indications that he's you know a level-headed he's team oriented he does seem like he's someone that um you know can be a little bit emotional just like you said we everyone all mass Twitter, you know, brings it out that he needs to definitely cool, cool his jets when it when it comes to you know complaining to the to the reps. But I mean, that's pretty much the only thing we can possibly complain about in terms of you know how Luca plays and stuff like that. Can be a little shot, uh, a little his shots can be a little ill advised sometimes, but mm -hmm. it can be it can be for some benefit because you still gotta respect it. And if he's not shooting a three, you're shutting down an option. So if he's willing to shoot it, whatever. But uh, you know, I do, I do love the fact. I remember there was a there was a quote, and it was I forgot what it was about, but he he basically shut it down. He's like, you know, I don't care. It's all it's all about winning, essentially. I, I'm paraphrasing. I, I think he know. had like probably like a, a really good stat line, but they that, lost, yeah. and he basically said like, I don't care how I did, we lost. What does it matter? Yeah. That's yeah, exactly. And that's the type of stuff that I I like to hear personally. Because, yeah, for sure. You, know, you can have all all the stats in the world, you know, people averaging and triple double and stuff again, everyone, everyone likes to see it. Um, but everyone likes to see the wins on top of that. And you're going to get the respect because sooner or later, the triple doubles will come and, and no one will care about it. Yeah. But absolutely. What people will continually care about is how you affect winning. Yeah. So, yeah. Luca looks like he's doing a lot of that, affecting a lot of winning. So, uh, Luca in his stat line, we mentioned 34 points, 13 rebounds, nine assists, four blocks, two steals in a, what, 11-point win last night. 
And after the game, Carlisle basically said, uh, quote, that stat line was spectacular, but he played even better than that. And I think that is pretty indicative. That's one of those things where it's like, as great as he did, he could have certainly done even more. It just, the game didn't call for it. And I think that's as well Mm -hmm. one of those things where it's tempting, I think, for guys to go all out. But I think Luca has a pretty good understanding of doing what the game kind of asks in that moment of him, you know? Like Mm -hmm. not trying to like, I'm going to start hunting my shot to try and get 40 or 50 or whatever. Like I've never really seen that from Luca. It seems like any time, even his big scoring games, whether it was like the 45, I think it was against the Spurs or whatever last year, he looks like he's always just kind of doing what makes sense in that scenario. It's not just like, uh, okay, I'm going to start trying to do these superstars things uh, and just put up big numbers myself. Like it's, more based around all right let's play smart do what we need to and we'll we'll figure it out as we go i agree permission to speak hyperbolically all right i think what we've seen of luca is the blueprint on how you insert yourself into goat status right yeah because when everyone talks about the greatest of all time you know we say michael jordan we say LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, and we always bring up what they did offensively and stuff like that, but we tend to forget Michael Jordan was a damn good defender. Of course, he had Scottie Pippen on his team, but Jordan was a damn good defender. Um, LeBron, of course, damn good defender. I think they've actually Michael's probably won a couple of uh, defensive defensive players of the year. year. LeBron has been multi-time first team. Defensive first team, yeah. Even Kobe has been uh, uh, first team all defense or somewhere an all defensive type player yeah and i'm not saying luca can be an all defensive type player but the fact that he is he can do any, he can do basically anything on offense he can you know play make he can score he can base any facet of offense luca can do and i don't think it was to the degree of i don't think michael and kobe and all of them had all that to the degree it's not as well rounded they're just really good scores and they were they used their fact that they were really good scores the fact that they could pass a little bit mm-hmm. but they weren't they weren't like all worldly like lebron and like luca but insert the fact that they can play defense as well on top of that i mean that's top i don't want to say five yeah it's probably top five without question um i just questioned it but i'm dumb so yeah <laughs> top <laughs> top five in the league today because not a lot of people I mean, we've seen you know, Steph Curry, they had to hide him on defense. He's lucky. He's blessed the fact that he had Clay Thompson. He had Draymond Green. He had all yeah. sorts of defenders around him. Um, James Harden, you know, he's not known for playing defense. He's, he does it every now and then, but. He's uh, capable. He just doesn't he's like capable. to use it. He just it. doesn't do it. Um, yeah. Kevin Durant's not known for defense, even though he's like. He's actually, had stretches where he has been a great defender, but he's yeah. largely just been average for most of his career, I think. Exactly. exactly. And so, um, you know, and. We're, we're seeing it now. Time will come where eventually all the league will see it because people who casually watch the Mavs still think Luca as a uh, minus defender. I I watched the, the Charlotte broadcast last night and they were saying, they're, they're basically talking about old Luca, like, oh yeah, he's not that good at defensively and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, I haven't been watching, dude. I mean, I understand you're probably really busy watching the Charlotte Hornets, but mm-hmm. don't sleep on Luca. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, people are still sleeping on Maxi, and he's still trying to take him off the dribble. And yep. <laughs> and it's like, uh, you better catch up on your film, guys. So I mean, yeah, for sure. Defense, so yeah. yeah, it's definitely something to be excited about with with Luca. And I'm 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 inserting him at the beginning of the year when the whole ESPN thing came out, saying mm-hmm. that Luca was number four in terms of players in the league. And I was like, ah, I don't really, I didn't really believe that to be honest, because we had uh, Kevin Durant, because we had Steph Curry back. But now I'm just like. Yo, he's he's doing everything. There's like no, there pretty at this point. There's no part of the game where he's not able to contribute, and he still contributes offensively at a high level. He's top five. Top yeah, five. I think there's a trend as well, like a an impulse people have. They saw how he rated and that they put him fourth, and then he struggled early in the year. He came in mm-hmm. not in game shape, and you know that's not great, but people saw that and they took the opportunity did, to though. jab at him and poke at him as if the bubble didn't happen, as if his playoff mm-hmm. performance didn't happen. They'll say he's overrated or they'll do this. They'll laugh about the fact that uh, through the first 
five games or whatever it was, JaVale McGee almost had as many made three pointers as him in the season. Like <laughs> they'll do all those things or that Ben yeah. Simmons was creeping up in terms of percentage over Luca. Like, yeah, they'll, they'll do all those things, mm-hmm. but they'll be loud when things aren't great and they'll scream that he's overrated if they're not Dallas fans or whatever. Yeah. But when he breaks out like this, now it's like, Oh no, he, he's, he's still overrated. Or, mm-hmm. oh, they're just spinning it. Like, everyone acts like there's a hype machine around him. And I don't understand it. Like, it's one of those things where it's like, so you're talking smack when he's not playing his usual standard, mm-hmm. even though it's still better than a lot of guys in the majority of the league's standard. Mm-hmm. And and even when he does break out and he looks just as good as he was last year. Even better some, in some games. In, yeah, in some cases, even better. Mm-hmm. Then they're still insisting, like, oh, he's not that sweet. Like, it's all right to acknowledge like, yeah, a player came in, a young player came in, struggled early, and then he figured it out. And now he's much better. Like yeah. it, it's a weird, almost tribalistic kind of thing. Yeah. Like, if he's I'm on your to... team, you have to insist he's not as good as your guy. And that's how you have people saying uh, other incredible players like Devin Booker. Oh, well, they're better than Luca. Like eh, no, it, it's okay yeah. to say both are awesome without trying to level him up <laughs> to that level but yeah, like yeah. Luca career triple doubles here. This was uh, something the broadcast threw out. Um, Grant Hill, 29 for his career. Ben Simmons, 29. Now, if Simmons has played four seasons, so he's at an incredible clip on that as well. Michael yep. Jordan, uh, 15 seasons, had 28. Luca's sitting at 27. And that was going into the game. Now, obviously, he came, a, a, what, an assist shy of another yeah. triple double. But the fact that in three seasons, he's already climbing up this like all time triple double list to the point where in NBA history, he sits 16th currently in triple doubles. (laughs) Like I know when you get to the top and you're chasing, uh, you know, whether it's Russell Westbrook or Jason Kidd or whatever, like that's Mm. long, long odds. You got to get like a hundred something, you know, triple doubles. But the fact that he's already moved into basically top 15 in year three in year, <laughs> at the very start of year three, year three exactly is, 10 games in. is ridiculous. He's going to rewrite record books. I don't think there's any question of that. You know, yeah. And all uh, right. But there some, is more, there is more to this team than Luca. as much as I love him. I oh love yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, so. Absolutely. And you know, this team, we talked about their depth and everything, despite having five guys out, they still got pretty solid performances up and down. Hardaway Jr., you know, high volume shooting, but still 18 points in that three assists, two steals. So I like seeing him pick that end up a little bit. Let it fly, more. let it fly, Tim. Let it fly. Yep. yep. <laughs> oh, he's always going to let it fly. He's, he's been on a hot streak fly. shooting. He's been on a yep. much hotter streak shooting. In fact, what's his his stat line at right now as far as his three point shooting? It's uh, this shooting. season, he is shooting <laughs> from three, 42%. So he's actually better right now than he was last year when he shot 39.8%, basically 40%. So nice. yeah, Hardaway Jr. is doing much, much uh, better now the last few games. I know he's, he started out with a little bit of a rut and people were getting frustrated. I, I hearkened back to last year, the first month of the season, we were, even you, I think got, and you're a, you're a Hardaway fan uh, as far yeah. as like defender, I should say. Uh, and we were talking about like, man, he's been really bad this first month of the season. The game I covered <laughs> him was in the locker room pre pandemic. Uh, you, you could hear him on the court drop, like screaming F bombs, missing wide open threes. And then in the <laughs> locker room, he was just pissed off. Didn't want to talk to people. Uh, looked miserable. And I was like, man, if he doesn't break out of this, he might not be around much longer with that contract. And then he seemed to turn a corner and suddenly it was like, oh, he's like our legit number three. I don't know if he's our best idea for number three, but at the very least, he's very capable. And it's kind of started, you know, thankfully he's turned the corner faster this year than he did last year, but Mm -hmm. he's definitely hit a hot streak as of late. And it's not just, what was it? The Orlando game where he had eight threes or whatever, it was like eight for 13. Um, yeah, eight of 13 from three, 36 points. It's not just that. Like, he's being, you know, in this case, I think he was like four of 10 from three yesterday. Um, still good. Oh, yeah, it's still 40%. <laughs> I'm just cool. saying, like, he's doing much better. And it's like, yeah. he's always going to be a guy who, if he can get 10 or 12 three looks, he's going to take them. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of, all right, you can at least make 
four or five, six of them, maybe <laughs> if you're doing that, then all right, fine. You've got some leeway with that, but yeah. when you start throwing up O of 12, then we're going to have to talk about this. <laughs> well, <if> you, <laughs> yeah. It's like, you got to recognize when tonight's not your night and he's not that type of guy. He's going to, he's going to put up, he's going to shoot 12 regardless. Of how oh yeah. No, there, there's no doubt. It's like a Dion waiters, J.R. Smith type guy. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, so, one thing to call out as well with the lineup shakeups we were talking about. Since Willie Cauley Stein joined the starting lineup, the Mavericks are four and zero. Coincidence? Uh, I think that's a, a complete win for Mavs Twitter. <laughs> yeah, Every, everybody on Mavs Twitter was just like, "Put look." I understand that you don't want to start Maxi Kleba for, I guess, roster uh, purposes and stuff like that because we need someone that could possibly score on for the bench. But yeah. Dwight Powell, Dwight Powelling it as of right now. He's right. Good. So, yeah, Willie Willie's doing good. I like the I like the the Twin Towers approach last night. Um, you know, it, it's definitely when you got two guys who are one is seven three, the other one's legit seven feet, mm-hmm. long as crap. Both of them capable of shot blocking and uh, altering shots. It it definitely um, it makes it harder for the offense to 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 go on the inside, and we can take especially today's basketball where everything is either threes or layups and you take away layups and then you're you're left with just being you know hoping that your threes are falling if they're not falling like the the hornets weren't yesterday it's not going to be a good look for you but the question is can they keep this up when they go up against let's say the milwaukee bucks who happen we will be covering that game friday i know it's gonna be exciting it's gonna be very Uh, exciting yeah so let's see how they do um with the Giannis and and Brook Lopez, see how they do with that tandem because um, yep. PJ Washington and Bismack Biombo. It's, yeah, it's yeah, definitely be, a good uh, yeah, <laughs> it's definitely a good game to to see how how things can be, but like a real test as well. Yeah, so in the game, I'd like to see more scoring from Willie. Last uh, last game had four points, but. 14 rebounds, three blocks. I will mm-hmm. take that in the starting lineup because that fills too, yeah. two big needs for this team. Rebounding, which has continued to be a weakness for them. And uh, yes, obviously KP coming back will help that even though he only had four last night. Uh, we know he was a nine and a half boards a game, basically player, which was mm-hmm. a career high last year. So I think KP back and having Kali Stein in the starting lineup certainly addresses two big needs. And Kali Stein, if you're going to give me you know, multiple blocks a game, then that's another good rim protector. Dwight Powell is not a rim protector. He's Having not. the flexibility of Maxi, KP, and Willie Cauley Stein, all of which are capable rim protectors, is very, very important for this team. Like you said, yep. everything is either three or at the rim. So if you can limit the effectiveness of one of those things and say, all right, if you're going to beat us, you got to stay pretty much red hot the entire mm-hmm. game shooting from yep. outside, then you give yourself a distinct advantage. Yep. I totally agree with everything you just said. Uh, last night marked Rick Carlisle's 800th win as an NBA coach. That moves him into, he is the 16th coach in NBA history to reach 800 career wins, has a win percentage of uh, 54.6% all time. That's 864. Nice. Not bad. Not bad. I know a lot of people are very, (laughs) for some reason, Carlisle has become as polarizing as Powell. I think a lot of that just comes from how long he's been here and they look at him and they're like, (laughs) yeah, you you got a championship. That was like a decade ago. Yeah. I mean, come on, man. How many, how many conference finals appearances does he have? The one. (laughs) <laughs> like they look at stuff like that and like yeah i get it but also realize we gave him a bucket of scraps for most of those years and he still yeah. put it together where like nine out of ten times they were at least a playoff team so yeah it's it's one of those kind of ridiculous setups in that regard this is a nice milestone for rick again it's pretty exclusive uh company to be keeping in that case and uh i think he's he's a coach who's going to tinker with things. You're not always going to understand or agree with his decisions as we Mm -hmm. don't always, we've talked at times, whether his rotation or when he runs certain guys in and out, uh, not making sense. I talked about that. I think in a bubble game last year, even at the very end of the year where it was against, I think Portland KP had like 17 points in the first quarter or something ridiculous came out of the game, despite being red hot, no points in the second quarter, even though he got put in like late in this quarter, uh, went off again in the third quarter for like another 14 points. 
and then didn't get like going again until like six minutes or less of the game. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah. you got to find a better balance to that. I understand not wanting to run him into the ground, but at the same time, it's like, if he's red hot every time he's shooting it, maybe don't let a quarter and a half of the game pass without yeah. him getting the ball. So, yeah, he does some pretty squirrely stuff like that, but I mean, yeah, but he's, he, he's outside outside of the outside of the championship. Uh, he's earned my respect by having that OJ Mayo Maverick team <laughs> and taking them to the. You need to take them to the playoffs. Yeah, I know that team missed. It was forty. That they, team they went five hundred, forty two yeah, and forty two, and the Lakers yeah. got. Okay, well, got still that's impressive playoffs. because that team was not. So does he lose your respect now for saying no, 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 like, no, he got my respect no, no, no. for getting that team to the play? Oh wait, they didn't. <laughs> Like, oh, and he's taking a passive aggressive shot there. <laughs> no, but still, 42 and 42, OJ Mayo. Who was uh, it? OJ Mayo, Dar- Darren Collison. I remember we were closing out games with like Mike James as point guards. So I was like, God, yeah. Geez. Mike James on a 10 day contract. <laughs> like, what in, the, what in the world? You're on a 10 day contract and you, you're shooting the game winning shot. Like, I, I don't understand. Like, whatever. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very odd equation for sure what what do you think about i mean of course he has that uh stigma of not of not playing rookies um unless he like absolutely has to mm-hmm. like with luca and dennis smith because like we really had no one else um i that is a frustration that i have um and he has his reasons i of course i always i always like to stick away i'm not at practice i don't see everything that he's seen the only thing i see is like what's being shown on during the games but the fact that, you know, Josh Green is not getting the type of run, you know, like literally five rotational players have to be out before he's like Josh Green gets any significant playing time is frustrating. And when he gets in, he still he seems like he's not 100 percent comfortable sure. with with, you know, being in the offense. He's not getting a lot of touches and stuff like mm-hmm. that. I, mean, I, I do want to see him feel a little bit more comfortable. Because it's like it's like that thing. I know you were a superstar in high school, but you know guys like myself who are who are fringe rotational players. That I was a superstar. I'm just kidding, bro. You know <laughs> I'm like, what I have like ten points a game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but guys like guys like ourselves who are fringe players, it's like as soon as we mess up one time, we're looking over our shoulder to see, you know, if we're about to get pulled and stuff. And I think that's, um, I know we're trying to win, but you know, given the circumstances of everyone being out, I do want to see it. I do want to see um, Josh Green play with a little bit more, with more freedom, a little bit more com- comfortability. I don't know if that's even a word, but you know, just you know, allow comfort. him to make some <laughs> comfort. That's probably the better word. Uh, <laughs> allow him to make some mistakes, man. I remember like they yanked him after he threw that alley oop to Willie Cauley Stein. Yeah, first one where Cauley Stein blew it. Yeah, it was just like, come on, man, just let him make some mistakes. I want to see Tyrell Terry play with Luca. Um, that's one of the things I. I've been saying that to myself, but this is now me putting it out to the out to the ether. Uh, so hopefully this can go back to uh, Carlisle in some way. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think Rick would care what we have to say on us. No, no, but at least, at least it will like cross over some you know brain molecules and stuff like that. You're like, yeah, I would like to see that. Yeah. Eventually, the right person would be like, hey, mom, do you just try it out, just like for five minutes, uh, and then maybe uh, Luca can get him to wide open looks, and then. Yeah. And to, to your point that you were getting at there. Yeah. Rick has a history of not really trusting rookies a whole lot. There have been exceptions. Obviously the, the Dennis Smith junior year was a really bad Mavericks team. That was like a 24 win Mavericks team. Yeah. And your star, your star. It was literally good enough to get players them. were Yogi Ferrell, <laughs> Harrison Barnes and a uh, Dennis Smith junior. So yeah. that wasn't a great team by any stretch. And yeah, at that point, you're you have to see what the kids got. And Rick looked at him for about a year, year and a half, and pretty much was like, "I'm not impressed, honestly." <laughs> like, as far as handing the keys of the kingdom to this guy, I don't see it. Yeah. And so he wanted him to transition more into a, a role player, which didn't sit well. And obviously, we know how that went. But yeah, Rick, Rick, and Sorry, rookies dude. have never done that. He likes them to have more, more, I guess experience even if it's just in like practice or garbage time and things of that but Mm -hmm. yeah you're going to run into situations where you you don't have a choice the guy is so good and so polished already whether it be luca or something i think he realized real quick with luca within the first 20 games like i need to basically unleash this guy you remember Mm -hmm. when we did video luca's rookie year 
talking about the potential freeze out, right? No, oh, yeah. And With him and John half the people saying we were dead on and the other half acting like we were spreading propaganda that we were making up. <laughs> and uh, then what happened? All the guys that were supposedly freezing them out got traded. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that worked. Yeah. 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 And Luca got the keys to the kingdom and suddenly, oh, look at that. The team got much better instead of being mediocre at best. Weird. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's not to say like that Luca influenced that at all, like in terms of like him wanting them gone. That's not yeah. his style. Yeah, it no wasn't, it wasn't. Luka. In fact, Luca, Luca seemed a little distraught after they traded, you know, that night yeah. where they traded everybody and they asked him about it in the locker room. Uh, maybe he was playing it and he was playing it off. I, I don't know. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, speculate. Speculate. He did, right. He did seem a little distraught that, you know, because he did look like he had. You know, we had that incident of DeAndre Jordan pushing him out the way for the rebound. Yeah, the freeze it looked out. like he did kind of get along well with DeAndre. Like, they joked around a lot. We have that gif of uh, DeAndre messing with uh, Luca's hair, and then yep. you see Luca smiling and stuff like that. So, yep. I mean, they did look like they had a good relationship, so he did seem a little distraught, but nothing, you know. Yeah, for sure. Crazy. So, it's, it's interesting to – to see what uh, what Rick's relationship in that regard with rookies is, even Luca, as talented as he is, now it was record time with Luca for him to just mm-hmm. trust him and understand. Like I have to let him off the leash mm-hmm. because what makes him so special is his ability to kind of orchestrate and, mm-hmm. for lack yeah. of a better term, freestyle on his mm-hmm. own. Like to to just be creative and unique in his approach to things. That's all very true. I don't I don't have mm-hmm. any issue. Uh, with that but as far as the these young pups coming through Josh Green and them yeah I, I think you're going to see a much more restrained approach by Rick as far as mm-hmm. their rotation minutes because they do I mean all of them are in different ways raw or have weaknesses that are problematic right now Tyrell mm-hmm. Gary, I'd love to see him get some spot up looks but he's an undersized six foot two uh, bean pole of a point slash shooting guard and as a result of that he's probably not going to get a whole lot of burn this year even though i'd like to see him get some you call him a bean pole that's mean dude (laughs) (laughs) yeah no only is a a profile piece he's a bean as well (laughs) (laughs) you got the profile piece i did on him he's been fighting the too small label his whole career unfortunately (laughs) probably have to fight it for a little while longer (laughs) just a little while longer yeah, as a that. Mav show, you just, you just added the, to that. You're, you're part of the problem. I know. I was just about to say, as a Mavs <laughs> YouTube channel that uh, that praised the selecting of him, immediately referred to him as a bean pole. But uh, uh, yeah, it's he's he's going to need some time, I think, and I think Rick's going to be a little reluctant to put him out there, unless you know maybe things change. We know this is a very weird, fluid season. Maybe he'll get some opportunities down the road, but I don't think Rick sees that yet. Uh, well, Green, if five, get, if, if five rotational players being out still leads to you. Yeah. The well, it's also how early in the year it is, right? That's true. If it was five rotational players out mid or late season, I think, yeah, you would see Terry. So it just depends. I think Rick wants Hopefully. him to get a little bit more ingrained and uh, integrated into the whole flow of things, the speed. Cause that's the that's thing. True. And I talked about this with Tyrell Terry, you can have unreal marksmanship, but if you're a, a undersized guy with not blazing speed or anything like that it takes time to adjust to the speed and like the speed of the nba the length of the defenders charging at you closing out it's going to bother you for a little while like even steph had to take a little bit of time before he really figured it out for golden state now he did it faster than i think a lot of guys we talked then trey young's another another good example yes trey young was a bust like a couple of weeks into the league yeah, we, th- there was a lot of talk about that, that the first almost half of the season, Trey Young as a rookie uh, might be a bust. And he's turned out to be a fantastic offensive player, a great mm-hmm. scorer and everything like that. But, you know, guys take time, take time to figure it out. Seth Curry here didn't really break through in an NBA rotation until his third year, and that was with Dallas. He'd been up and down the, the D League, G League, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until here in 2016 that he finally broke through and actually, you know, made something. And he had it was like that. it was like post post All Star break the year before that with Sacramento. That's when that's when he every, started to. But like I'm yeah, talking about that's when he, when he started, really yeah. broke through and like basically earned his contract role he got then with Portland because he had a mm-hmm. setback the next year, his second year with Dallas, that first stint with a mm-hmm. stress reaction in his knee, he missed the entire year. Then he got the new deal to go to Portland for a couple of years, but. Yeah, he's uh, he's 
he's a good example of that. A guy who he's a, a crafty scorer, a, a obviously brilliant three point shooter. And it took time for him to adjust and to figure things out. So people saying like, oh, Tyrell Terry, he's, he's a crap pick. He's not going to do anything like, bro, we're 10 games in. Yeah. <laughs> um, can yeah. we have a little Slower bit of patience roll. for a second round draft pick? It is, uh, it's, uh, you know, maps, Twitter, everything like that. You know, we've always got to operate on both sides or both extremes of the of the spectrum to be there yeah he, he can be an all-star or he's a bust he's like that i mean yeah there's there's truth to that and how mavs twitter specifically but i think we're Especially more mavs facebook yeah mavs uh, facebook we more. don't talk about mavs facebook um <laughs> I, I think like as far as like nba communities go there's mm. that strain in all of them i think but there is something we see obviously mavs twitter a lot more often and so we're we're more accustomed to that one and it stands out more to us. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, there's something to be said for giving guys like that a little bit of time. And as a result, I don't think that, he, that he's going to get a lot of burn this year. I think green has a chance to, because of his <laughs> athleticism and length and size. Okay. He'll get some opportunity. It's just still going to be limited. He's going to be short leash. See what you do. If you make a mistake or two or something like that, then he'll probably get pulled. He it's just the nature night. of the beast. You look good last night. I saw I saw a lot of good things. Uh, yeah, from from Green, Josh Green. Um, I mean his his effort. I love it. Um, him him and Iwundu. Sorry, I need to pronounce that right. He's he's my native guy. Um, yeah, I love their I love their uh, their. I get, I forgot the, the effort. I was like, what the freak? I lose words. But yeah, their effort on defense. I love the fact that they they, they try so hard. Uh, Josh Green got, I think, three really good offensive rebounds. There was mm -hmm. one where he completely skied over one, one uh, person to do it. It's it's, it's impressive. I, I I want to see more of him. I understand everything you said about how Rick does him. And, and the reason why he's not, especially because, hey, we're we're basically in win we're win now mode. Essentially, um, we're not rebuilding anymore. So you know, yeah, if you can't contribute to us yeah. winning on a consistent basis. Then we're not gonna. We're not going to see a whole lot of you, but for you know, sure, one but. can still hope that something clicks with him and he turns into the next Josh Howard or something like that. <laughs> that would be, that'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> but yeah, so it's a 104 93 Mavericks victory. They have now won what four straight at this point, or is it five? Four. Four. Uh, five? four. I can verify this rather quickly, and I suppose I probably should have four. taken. The two seconds to verify so yes four straight now tomorrow they're going to go to milwaukee i will be covering that game after the fact obviously remotely because you know pandemic and it's in milwaukee mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, i'll be covering that one so i'll have i'll try to come back then on saturday to do some sort of show uh, and i'll have clips i'll have audio i plan to do this up big and uh, we'll see what we can do. But we'll get into a rotation here. Uh, I got a couple games next week I'm covering as well. So awesome. should have a lot of great content coming. But I think that's going to do it for the time we got today. Thank here. you, as always, for jumping on, any. Man, my pleasure, dude. I appreciate you letting me get on. It's, it's, it's always fun talking Mavs and everything like that. It's an exciting year. So I, yeah. feel, I feel more excited to talk about it because – uh, people who don't know, I'm in, uh, I'm in, uh, health and safety protocols right now. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I, I just watch, you know, podcasts and stuff like that all day. And I'm just like, I just want to freaking just talk about, you know, what stuff I'm seeing and stuff I'm reading about and stuff like that. So cool. thanks for letting me on. That's basically what I'm saying. So, yeah, no problem at all. But uh, guys, don't forget to like this video, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect uh, when any channel drops. Be sure to subscribe to that as well. We'll of course plug yeah. that. And That'll be that's fun. I actually got I, so I my my show's gonna be different than yours. Okay. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna be talking. I think all NBA and then a couple of football stuff. But I'm gonna have about uh, three of my friends from college. Um, we're not gonna be as polished as you, of course. We're we're just gonna basically just be shooting the shooting the breeze with each other talking basketball and, and stuff like that uh we have like three maps fans so 
we're definitely going to see us talk a whole bunch of uh, ish about the Mavs and stuff like that, especially okay. when they beat up on teams. Uh, we have a Knicks fan too, so we're going to talk about ish to him. Okay, <laughs> interesting. But I think I think he's I think he's finally jumped ship and he's finally hopped on the Brooklyn bandwagon pre pre the James Harden trade. So I'll give him a little bit of credit, but uh, okay. Yeah, this is gonna be fun. It's, it's gonna be a lot more fun. A little is his bit of name East Side. No, no. <laughs> Hell no. no. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a whole lot of fun. I can't wait. Okay, cool. Yeah, that yeah. that should be cool. I'll be sure to check that out. But uh, yeah, so guys, if you want to support the Dallas Prospect, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash the Dallas Prospect. Also check us out, uh, become a member here on YouTube as well. All kinds of great perks and I'm going to start rolling out some membership exclusive perks as well. And of course, if we're doing a live stream, I know this one ended up not being a live stream because of some technical stuff, but uh, you always have the option as well to just hit up the super chat. Lots of ways to support the show and to help us grow as we move forward. But until next time, that is our time. Any, I'll let you hit the tagline. Ooh. Remember, or I'll fire you for messing it up. I mean, <laughs> God dang it. Remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. Salute.